That, that you know, like to say that you've never dated anybody that's over six foot five. Well, you're tall phobic. Well, right. That's that's a ridiculous right. statement. That doesn't make any sense. You know, to say that you've uh, you've never dated anybody that weighs more than three hundred pounds. You, you know, you're uh, you're mass phobic. Yeah. That's ridiculous you're too. You're fattest. Yeah. It's just all of it's stupid. It's all stupid. People telling, but this what they're doing is it's a bunch of people that are pushing this idea of being open, entirely open to uh, all things trans. That you, as a heterosexual person, should not just recognize that this is a woman because they transferred from a, a male to a female, but recognize even if they haven't transferred and recognize them in terms of sexual selection, in terms of a date. Right. And that's just fucking stupid. Because you can decide, right, you're not into certain things. Like, I'm not really into girls with short hair. You can decide that. It's not my thing. I don't like girls with shaved heads. I don't find it attractive. Like, a woman can say that, too. I don't like guys with creepy mustaches. And nobody gets mad at them. Right. But if a man says to certain people, I'm not into chicks with dicks, <laughs> then that guy's a piece of shit. Or what about there's a thing called <sighs> sexual racism, where you specifically... Uh, you know, are not attracted to a particular, you know. You know yes. I, I don't like uh, Asian men. I don't like uh, right. uh, black right. women, right? You're not supposed to instantiate those sexual preferences if the racial cue is the one that's causing you to either be attracted or not attracted to someone. What do you think of that? Um, well, there's certainly beautiful people of all race, so that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me in terms of the person's selection. Like, if you tell me you've never seen a beautiful black woman, right. like, you're crazy. Like, you haven't met enough black women. If you tell me you haven't seen a beautiful Asian woman, like, what? Right. What are you saying? Like, right. there's beautiful people. In, and there's also, you should be allowed to, to be with whoever you want in right. terms of not, but, but why is it, it's always sex, right? Because, like, obnoxious people. Here's a perfect example. I don't like friends that are loud and get drunk in public. Oh, what are you, drunk phobic? <laughs> no, I just don't enjoy that. Right. So like in terms of sexual selection, in terms you, I, of dates. I tell you why that analogy might fail okay. with some of the progressives. You could alter your level of obnoxiousness. You could grow out of your obnoxiousness. Well, I know some people. Conceivably, theoretically, no, right? I know some people are fucked. That's just who they are. Fair enough. You want to name any names? No. <laughs> but your race is a immutable part of you. Okay, that's and, a perspective. Yeah. I see that. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm, right. not, I'm not agreeing with it. Okay, uh, well, what about uh, tall versus short? Right. You know, what if you're a woman volleyball player and you're six foot three and you don't want to date a guy who's five feet tall? You know, are you, what are you? What are you? Are you? By, by the way, that is one of the biggest problems of being a very tall woman because one of the, one of the so there's something called assorted of mating in evolutionary theory. Assorted of mating is basically birds of a feather flock together, mm -hmm. right? And that's very much the mechanism that drives mate choice, much more than opposites attract. Mm. So one of the assortative mating cues that people most assort on is height. So it's not so much that women want guys that are only six foot or taller, it's just that the woman wants a guy who's taller than her. Right. So if you look at, there is a study that I've discussed in the past uh, that looked at something like 720 actual couples, and I think there was only a single one out of the 720 where the woman was taller than the man. Now, once a woman gets to be over a certain height, she's six foot two, six foot three, her potential pool of mm -hmm. prospective suitors really shrinks. And so if you have a daughter, you really want to pray that she doesn't get too tall because boy, are her choices going to be limited because few women want to date a shorter guy than them. Yeah, when you're a six foot three, six foot four woman, you're that's done. gotta be a tough spot. I mean, you're basically relegated to big athletes or big exactly. giant people. The, the, mm. the, the other place where you get this sort of assortative mating is where you get women who are super educated. Ah, uh, that makes sense. The yeah. exact same thing happens. Sure. The more educated a woman gets, the worse her marriage prospects because the more sophisticated women are, the more they insist on a high status male. And therefore, as I get more educated as a woman, there are just fewer men who are as educated or more than me. And therefore, I'm doomed to a life of solitude. That totally makes sense. That totally makes sense, especially considering that men... You know, in general, they get insecure around women who are more successful yes. and more educated or more intelligent. Like very rarely are men comfortable with a woman who has to explain things to them. Absolutely. And yeah. by, by the way, I think, so I have another theory, which I'd like to at some point test. Maybe someone will steal it now. So when you have a couple that gets married very young, 
they are judging one another based on their mate value at 18 or 19, right? So Tony is the high school quarterback, and so he's the hot guy, and I'm the cheerleader. And then later, he stagnates. He doesn't go on with his career, whereas I go on and become a physician, I, mm. the cheerleader. So at 29, there is now a huge inequity between our two mating values on the mating market, right? So when we were both 19, the fact that we had roughly the same mating value made us a very attractive, stable couple. But Tony turned out to be a fucking loser. Exactly. He's a lame duck. Exactly. And so I, so I have a theory that, and I'd like to at some point test it, maybe some graduate student will write to me saying, I'll work with this on you, Dr. Saad. I have a theory whereby I think that in many cases where people end up divorcing when they married young, it's precisely because that which started as equitable mating values at time T0 turned out to have huge divergence in our trajectory on the mating market. And that puts a huge strain on the marriage, especially when the wife's status is going up. Mm. The, the best way to ensure that the marriage ends is for the status of the woman to keep going up and that of the man to either stagnate or go down. That's going to be doomed. That makes sense. It, may, it makes sense that... Also, you know, obviously the young marriages are rough because people grow and they don't necessarily grow together. Right. When you catch people 10 years later and they're oftentimes radically different people. Right. But then there's also the thing that women don't seem to, for the most part, respect a man who's not doing as well as them. Right. You know, that's a, that's a giant issue. Even if the guy's doing okay. Like, say if your guy's making $50,000 a year, that's a very good living. He's out there doing well. But you make three hundred. You make three hundred grand a year, and this fucking loser's over here with his fifty grand. Like you're kicking ass. You're like some big wig at some big corporation. Like that. That seems to be a real sticking yeah. point. And with men, especially if they have a household where they contribute income together, they they pile all their income, and the man starts spending the woman's money on stuff. You know, right. he starts buying stuff. He's got a new fishing rod. Where'd you get that with your money or my money? <laughs> you know, it gets weird, right? right? And incidentally, uh, so speaking of say consumer psychology stuff that I study, when you take a very rich woman and you go out on a date with her, even though she obviously can afford the dinner and she can afford anything that you're going to buy her, if you exhibit cues of frugality, cheapness, mm -hmm. that's the perfect way to ensure that you won't have a second date. So it's not so much a question of, uh, you know, it's an old sexist uh, ritual whereby men were wooing women. It really is an honest signal of your commitment to, to a woman. So the best way, and I get many of these letters where people ask me, hey, professor, what are you, you know, ad you know dating advice? Well, you do have to exhibit generosity when you go out with yes. women. That, that, I mean, nuptial gift giving, nuptial gift giving is sort of the fancy term for courtship rituals across animal species. So many species, you have typically the male engaging in some form of courtship gift giving, and depending on the quality of the gift will determine whether the female will mate with you or not. Well, so much of what we do in marketing context is exactly that, right? It's the exact same phenomenon repeating itself in the human context, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, engagement rings, right? The fact that you're supposed to spend a quarter of your yearly salary on this rock. Is that really what it is? Yeah. It's, that's what it, I, mean, I don't know if everybody meets it. Oh, but that's, that's right. It is that, right? It's three months. Exactly. God, when you say a quarter of the <laughs> yearly salary, it makes you just go, what in the fuck is wrong with people? But the That's so much money. But here's the, but here's the reason. <laughs> here's the reason. You ready? It's, yes. it's, it's what's called a Zahavian signal. I don't know if I've ever discussed this in this, in this uh, podcast. Uh, a Zahavian signal is basically the idea that for a signal to be honest, it has to be costly. Otherwise, everybody could imitate it, right? Uh -huh. so, so, th so think about, for example, rites of passage in different cultures, right? If you want to demonstrate that you're a top warrior, the rite of passage has to be brutal. Otherwise, if it's only we all have to do five sit-ups, then every male could do it, and right. then the females can't determine the, the pretenders from the real guys, right? right. So, so you have, for example, bullet ant. Do you know this one? Mm -hmm. you, right? Sure. You put your hands through, right? I mean, that takes a lot of courage and capacity. Explain it to people who don't know what we're talking about. So this is a tribe in the Amazon whereby you take – the bullet ant is supposedly – biggest purveyor of pain that is humanly possible that you could experience my friend steve got stung by one did he and what did he was in uh bolivia i believe and uh he got stung 
and uh, in his heel, got him in the heel. And? He said it was just, he was delirious with exactly, pain. Exactly. And he said it lasts for a few hours, then it goes away. Right. So what they do in this tribe is they take a bunch of these ants in the order of a couple of hundred. One is enough to cause you agonizing, impossible, delirious pain. And they sedate them through this uh, uh, compound. Uh, and then they interweave them in these uh, gloves, these uh, leaf gloves, so that when they're coming to, they come out of their stupor and you have your hands in there, they start viciously biting you, stinging you. And you're supposed to withstand that pain without screaming. You have to take it in. So you sort of almost go into this religious fervor, this kind of uh, incantation. Yeah. And you have to do that ritual 20 separate occasions. Really? On t t 20 different times, on different days. 20? 20, before you are admitted into the you know tribe of warriors, whatever. Well, now let's think it back to the engagement ring, right? If all it takes for me to convince you of my honest intentions is to buy you flowers, and now let's go back behind the shed and you know have mm. sex, well, then a lot of cheaters are going to convince you of doing this when they really didn't have good intentions. But if it takes for me to spend a quarter of my salary to convince you that I have honest, so therefore this is a form of what's called Zahavian signaling because Zahavi was a Israeli ornithologist that studied this type of behavior, this costly signaling behavior using Arabian babblers, which is a type of bird. So here's another example of a Zahavian signal. Uh, you probably have seen this. Uh, when you have a predator, uh, that's looking at who to attack, you often will have gazelles starting to actually make themselves conspicuously visible to the predator. They come close to him and they start jumping from him. Have you ever seen this? Do you know? No. I think it's called strutting, not strutting. And can you think why that would be? No. Like, wh why are they not hiding? Why are they not making themselves uh, inconspicuous? Why, why are they drawing attention to themselves when there are 50 different gazelles that the predator could be pointing to. Why? Well, because what, it's, what, what that animal is saying is, the fact that I could stand here in front of you and jump up and down and make myself this visible suggests that it's probably a lost cause for you to try to go after me. I'm super fit, right? It's a mm. costly signal of my fitness. It's an honest signal, right? The one who is not doing this behavior is the one that you should be paying attention to. Oh, right? interesting. So this is called, and so I use this principle of Zahavian signaling to explain things like conspicuous consumption, right? The reason why you buy the fancy car that the other males can't hope to purchase, it's precisely because they can't afford to match your signal. Therefore, mm. it's an honest signal. The reason why I buy a $100 million painting that a monkey could have drawn shows how wealthy I am, that I could waste a hundred million dollars. Ah, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. It's yeah. all just mating stuff. It's uh, mating and food. Yeah. You don't want to become somebody's dinner. You want to find dinner and you want to have sex. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those signals are so fascinating when we see them in our culture and, and people get angry at them. Like you see some guy pull up in a Ferrari and you go, look at this fucking loser with his little dick. Right, you're like maybe, or maybe a guy with a shitload of money wants to let the world know because he likes to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you right? I've shared actually on this show. I think the stories about my one of my brothers who was a big car collector, mm -hmm. three Ferraris, Aston Martin Lagunda, and I've even shared a story which I'm happy to repeat. Uh, of we would go to nightclubs where he's this this is the Olympian. This is the five foot three guy, mm -hmm. who and we would go to nightclubs and he would pick the most beautiful woman and approach her, even though she's accompanied by a six foot four, you know, tough looking guy. And, and he had that confidence, I think, because he had that wealth mm -hmm. catapulting him. He, he it certainly right. helps. It certainly helps. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, it is a weird, ever prevalent aspect in the communication between men and females is how much money does the man have? Right. I mean, and this is one thing that a lot of women hate because they don't want to feel like they could be purchased. And they can't. They can't. They can't. Some can. Right. A lot can. It's a factor. 
it's a big fa- and a lot of women are very r- just rabidly ruthlessly independent they don't right. want that ever in their life and good for them but but the reality is it's a very effective strategy you pull up in that ferrari or that rolls royce or whatever the fuck you're driving and it, it has a big impact when you get to that nightclub and those studies have been done endlessly in yeah. evolutionary psychology. So here, here's one example. And you don't need to have a signal as big as a Ferrari. Just how you dress in terms of the status that is exhibited. Yeah. So there's a study that was done, I think, in the early 90s, where they manipulated the status, the, the sartorial, the, the attire of men and women into one of three different types. You know, high status, medium, and you know, some T-shirt or McDonald's uniform, whatever. And then they asked men and women... Uh, one of six possible, you know, would you go out on a, for a coffee with this guy? Would you go out on dinner? Would you have sex with him? Would you marry him? And across all six levels of relationships, the status of the attire of a man had a profound effect on the likelihood of the woman saying yes. Higher the status, the more likely she said yes. That same manipulation on women had zero effect on men. Yeah. In, in other words, no man has ever uttered the following wor- words. My God, you've got a juicy butt, and I'd love to have sex with you, but you're not exhibiting cues of ambition. Therefore, no sex for you, Linda. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a reality. That's a reality that people are very uncomfortable with. And I don't think women necessarily are craving the same reaction from men because of their ambition. I don't think women are ever saying... Through my ambition, I'm going to get a good man. Right. You know, that's just, that's just not a factor. But they do say, through my ambition, I'm never going to need a man. True. That's because that's because look, the reality is there's a lot of shitty human beings out there and some of them have penises. Right. And if you're a woman and you run into too many of those or for, by for whatever reason, because of your environment, because of your behavior, because of the circles you travel in, you're around too many of them. There's a a large dating pool of shitheads out there. You know, you just say, I don't want this in my life. I I don't want to be like my mom. I don't want to be like my sister. I want to be independent. But what you're not saying is, I am going to get a baller house and a baller car, and I'm going to get me a man. And the only woman that I know of that I've ever heard say that is disgusting. And the only woman that I ever, she's like, you know, talking about her success and how her success right. allows her to get men. She's a foul beast. Wow. Yeah, she's, uh, not, in, she's not healthy. But looking. incidentally, a lot of women, it's not so much that they're interested. I mean, resources are good only to the extent that they allow you to ascend the social hierarchy, right? Yes. This, this doesn't explain why some women are attracted to the starving artist, right? Because wh- why are so many women romanticizing over the guy with the guitar? But that's because they are choosing him based on his future trajectory, right? I am uh... banking, right? I am banking on the fact that you exhibit enough talent that I suspect that by investing in you, by choosing you, it's going to take me to that trajectory. Yeah. No woman has ever uttered the following words. You have no talent. You exhibit no ambition. You're never going to step out of the basement. Let's have sex. Yeah. Right? So, so it's not that women are only interested in money. They're interested in a panoply of cues, all of which relate to the potential of ascending the social hierarchy. 